A Home in Fiction, Geraldine Brooks. The speech was delivered um, on ABC Radio National on a Sunday afternoon and the purpose of these was to focus on Australian society and our way of life. The purpose of this speech is to use Brooks's um, literary knowledge as initially a journalist and then a, n a novel writer to reflect on the ways that mathematics is like poetry and the role of fiction writers in contributing to our society and our discoveries of the truth. Her lecture also reflects on her life specifically as a writer and she reflects on the creative writing processes. The main ideas in this speech is that fiction can be derived from fact and that it has a power and a value to our society. She talks about how an author is continually searching for the truth, which is like a kind of quest. She talks about her ability as a writer to hear voices and stories from the past and to give life to them through her writing. She talks about, um, she is like Atwood and Lessing in that she talks about the power of language as a, as a vehicle for exploring social issues and timeless human concerns of equality. She uses um, a number of techniques to engage her audience. She uses humour and rhetorical questions. She adopts an anecdotal style to talk about her own experiences. And she uses truncated sentences to cr convey her, her main ideas. She also uses allusion to um, literary references in order to provide examples for the points she's making. So she starts this speech in an anecdotal style a few years ago on a crisp autumn day. She creates an image of her lack of interest to attend a mathematics lecture. We've got images of her slumped, um, armed with a doodle pad, with hoping that things will let things in the lecture sail over her head and that she might even have a discreet little nap. And then we find that on the pad she carried that day that she started taking down some sentences and she was really drawn into the speaker's earnest desire to communicate their vision and their knowledge, which is something that's really universal, learning. The next paragraph she goes in to describe that mathematics is like poetry and she leans forward to hear more. She realised that she'd lived until that moment in an airlock and that she was prizing open the heavy door just to crack and that in the safe, sudden brief shaft of light she glimpsed a sliver of the world beyond. So here we've got an image of barriers to her understanding through the, through the airlock and the heavy door but this is a metaphor of her gaining an insight. That shaft of light is her stepping into an unknown world and seeing things differently. We've got here an antithesis between her negative expectation and her ignorance towards her renewed engagement with the topic and finding a new understanding. We've got here an image of mathematical pattern through the swoop of arcing out from a massive trunk. She connects with the speaker and she could imagine for a moment what it was to see with her eyes, to feel with her heart, to inhabit a space in which the language was not particular and national. And then she likens this understanding to music, a world in which every object sang to her. And she talks, she's really referring to knowledge um, as something that is around us to be taken in and understood. She uses high modality in this next paragraph, I know now, and to recreate her new understanding. She uses the metaphor of swimming in a sea of words to show that she is immersed, comfortable, and um, at peace with using language. Again, high modality in this paragraph, I am sure that her work and what she is sure of is that they are essentially the same. And she goes on in the last sentences of this paragraph to talking about she pushes her way deeper and deeper into the full truth of the world. So the power of knowledge to uncover the realities. And then she closes with, this also is what I must do. So we get a sense of her renewed purpose. This next paragraph really does show her, um, her delving into the idea of living in the metaphor, the sea of words.
She opens with It is my great good luck and she talks about the richness of the English language. She gives us many different examples about the complexity of words and how they pique her curiosity. She again shows her appreciation for her life as a novelist, but as a novelist I am glad. So this shows her appreciation and value of education and the ways that she can communicate ideas about the world. She links to the idea of creation and talks as a novelist about building female protagonists. She trails a vast raft of history and association behind her, subtly framing her in the reader's minds before I have let her utter a single word. So she talks about the ways that character can be presented to an audience and how that creates ideas. She's talking about building something. Then she uses literary illusion to show the idea that journalism her early years has equipped her with the tools to create and that her early, drill, her early dreams um, maybe are not initially realized in that journalism career but it gave her the skills needed to make a change. This idea of building is from Thoreau in the literary illusion it recurs throughout the speech. The youth gets together his materials to build a bridge to the moon. Those words build a bridge to the moon shows us that dreams can be perhaps out of reach, but it's something to aim towards. She talks about it did not go that way for her, and she started out wanting to build a woodshed. So again, this symbol of creation. She wanted a serviceable structure and a modestly useful purpose. And she talks about this as being a newspaper reporter rather than a novelist, having a clear purpose. But she closes with a sense of reality and a bit of humour in the sense that she knew that the stories that she wrote as a journalist would end up lining the floor of the budgie cage. So they don't really have an enduring power and a timeless quality. They really are temporary. She shifts to an autobiographical tone by referring to her 20s and the motif of the door comes up again because she states that unexpected doors opened for me. We've got repetition in this paragraph of hope a hope I hoped and that really reiterates the writer's desire. There's a valuable reflection of the history unfolding before her eyes and her intent was to create a better understanding of times. But now we see a shift to the present now as a fiction writer my ambition has slipped all reasonable bounds now so that repetition of this time she does allude again to Thoreau in that she aspires to build a bridge to the moon. Like the mathematician, she is nothing less um, after nothing less than eternal truths. And then she uses a rhetorical question, what is this world? How can we more perfectly describe it? Who are we and who have we been? And she reinforces this view with a strong connection to Lessing that education is the key. She talks about another thing is to have the means and that she has the materials. She, I have to hand materials I started assembling from the time I became literate and have continued to amass throughout my career in journalism and on to fiction. So she does reiterate this view of knowledge as power and literacy as the key to communication. She talks about her early career and the fact that she was put on assignment to cover the races and that this didn't really fulfill her and she closes with the idea that it did create a sense of pressure and the truncated sentence in consequence I would lose my job at the very least so she was really working without passion but it was a time when she was building the skills to contribute to society more meaningfully so she comments um, personally as much as I dislike that work she did acquire some useful and durable tools from it she learned a respect for factual details, which is essential for fiction. So in this sentence, she creates a paradox where she's combining the idea of fact and fiction, which the audience um, may have anticipated as being separate fact and fiction, two separate domains. And she kind of anticipates that by saying that this might seem odd. Why should a novelist need facts? Isn't fiction facts antonym? So she adds authenticity by anticipating response and she goes on and this is hyperphoric as she goes on to address these ideas 
and she talks about the way that fact can give the work a sense of authenticity to ensnare readers and convince them of the truth of the world as she has imagined it. And she talks about writing and the challenge of research, and she likens it using the simile, it is a bit like a quest or sometimes a vast puzzle. She uses colloquial language again as she reflects on her time as a racing cadet and how those skills get a good workout these days, so showing us the progression of gaining knowledge. She uses quite a blunt and authoritative tone, creating a sense of the reality for a reporter. The truncated sentences, a reporter must write, there must be a story, the moat just arriving, tell that to your desk, your editor will not wait for you to get your aura on straight, file or fail. So she does create a sense of pressure and the need to fulfill um, requirements. She builds, she extends on the metaphor of building as, an, as a writer. Words are stones and the book is a wall. You find just the right stone, the right shape and heft. And she goes on through the second person to draw the audience into the experience of writing. You try it, you jam it, you come back, you bring it, you cannot bear. Taking us into the journey of creation. She uses hyphens in this section to prompt the audience to pause and visualize, showing us that a contribution to society is a process and something the writer will need to um, focus in on. She amplifies this idea by fusing her anecdotal recount of personal experience, talking about her life lessons and the importance of effort. There can be no day without lifting stones. And then she talks about, and after enough days, if you have sweated enough and scraped enough skin off your hands, being patient and diligent with your craft and unsparing in the use of your backhoe, you will in the end have a wall. And it may even be a beautiful wall that will last a hundred years. So she talks about the enduring value of creating something to share with society. And then she reflects and shares with us the learning curve and her progression towards being a writer. Using first person, I learned to write fiction in stages. I wrote a reporter's book. I had learned. And then she talks about creating an image of struggle through the metaphor of building. For weeks, months, the stones lay scattered, resisting all attempts to gather them into a serviceable wall. We see that as she has grown into her career, there's been a greater confidence and she becomes more quirky and personal. And then she shares with us in this speech the pivotal moment that she became a novelist, the moment she recognised that she had become um, a novelist and a creator rather than a journalist. And she shares an experience which prompt her to think about human nature. She talked about the intensity of her reporting as a journalist and how that helped her understand the world, how it showed her um, the things people face. And she began to hear voices. So we have this idea of communication from the past and the idea of the storyteller as sharing. The questions nagged at me until I started hearing voices, yet her voice was very clear to me. So she's sharing um, the idea of a person from the past and the power it had over her. And something similar has happened in all her novels. Often the voices that speak to me are the voices of the unheard. So this shows us that narrative is about capturing history and sharing. And as a writer, she has the power to communicate these ideas. She refers to the marginalised group of people in our world and she talks to the idea that you will find these people in every era and she colloquially reinforces this idea of injustice in the closing sentence is that she as a woman is getting a crook deal. So she uh, positions the audience to reflect on those groups in society who are without power to share their experience. <laughs> 